One of the most respected writers of our time joins us this morning, Leon Uris, author of Exodus, Trinity, and so many other classics. He joins us live via satellite from Los Angeles. Good morning to you, Leon. It is such a pleasure to talk with you. Good morning, Eileen. Really, I am such a fan of your work, and you've done it again with this new book. And what I love about this one is that you said you went back to the papers you saved from childhood and drew from yeah. those for this novel. That's right. That's right. Uh, it was um, something that had been, uh, I, I'd saved these papers for a reason. I, I, I uh, pretty much sheltered myself from a, an unhappy childhood and said I'd never write about it. But as I progressed as a writer, I, became, I got more and more into personal relationships. And I think it was uh, inevitable that I, that I come to Mitt La Pass. And I think the thing that spurred it, uh, the thing that really triggered the, the book was the fact that I have a new family. I, I have a, uh, a two and a half year old and a four and a half year old now. And uh, this, um, I, I wasn't content to leave a legacy of despair as most writers uh, seem to uh, uh, do at the end of their careers, uh, especially with the end of the century coming. And uh, I, I wanted to um, uh, do something about this uh, uh, parent-child relationship uh, in my writing uh, that would leave um, uh, a legacy that was not one of uh, parental infallibility. Uh, let them know that their old man was um, a very uh, fallible man and, and had a lot of human frailties and, and uh, that he knew what fear was about. Uh, I think uh, there is a, uh, a thing that uh, you have to um, uh, think your parents are perfect and yes. you do all sorts of things in, in order to uh, win their love and affection and, and then spend the second half of your life trying to get over your childhood. Well, our parents often try to portray themselves, or those parents that don't understand that it's all right to be human try to portray themselves as perfect, and I hear what you're saying. This is a struggle with a father and a son, Nathan and Gideon. The, Gideon's constantly trying to prove himself to his father. His father will not accept his talents. Did that happen right. to you, Leon? Yeah, uh, something of that nature. Uh, my father, um, uh, I became his alter ego. I, uh, he lived his life uh, entirely through me, and I as a person just simply didn't matter. Uh, uh, he lived in my reflected glory, and, and it, was a, it was a very sad relationship. I was never treated as a human being. I could never go to him uh, if there was any kind of, if I had any kind of problem. This is a story, though, and you're right. What you do pass on to your children is a, is a legacy of survival of the human spirit. Um, are you telling us that you are a survivor? or that a whole group of people are survivors? Well, I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, I'm trying to reach one little boy who might be in trouble in his own life. That's, that's the way I got into writing, by reading uh, uh, Steinbeck had a tremendous uh, impact on my career. And uh, he was able to talk to me like his words were rainbows coming across time and space. And I got a letter from a friend of mine, uh, whom I became a uh, pen pal with a few years ago, a reader, who petitioned me for, to help his people uh, who were suffering a, a terrible social injustice or had suffered an injustice at the, at the hands of the American government. And he said, you have written about my life. He said, uh, uh, my, my struggles were the same as the heroes in this book. And uh, uh, I, for the first time in my life, I felt somebody understood my childhood. Now, this man is an Eskimo who lives in the Aleutian Islands. He's probably one of these fellows who's, who is using a chainsaw to free these whales. And when you can reach a reader like that, with that kind of identification, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's a fulfillment for me as a writer. And, and as I get older and wiser, I hope to get uh, more deeply into this. I think our audience would find me very remiss since we are a 60% Irish community, if I didn't mention Trinity. Ah, are you really? Yes, we are, <laughs> Sheridan Bigara, and I probably must say that it's probably the most widely read book among the American and those Irish that still live on the, yeah. in the British Isles in, in the world, probably. Uh, once again, people must have identified. Well, uh, there was uh, that one moment in Trinity uh, where I felt I'd made a breakthrough. Uh, I, I'd always admired the playwright. The playwright has to write with a laser beam. He's got, you know, you, you bear yourself up on the stage like Death of a Salesman right. or the Eugene O'Neill plays. And uh, in my, in my uh, writing, I would 
put a million men on a battlefield or create a new galaxy or do anything I wanted at the typewriter. But uh, there was a scene where Connor Larkin is leaving home and there were either four or five other people involved in the scene. And suddenly they were all lamenting their, their problems and yelling at each other, but no one heard the other. Hmm. And uh, I said, I, I had the sudden flush that this was the first real piece of playwriting that I had ever done as a novelist, a really fine playwriting. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's uh, uh, some talk about, uh, well, there was actually a 27, 28 hour reading of Trinity this last St. Patrick's Day out in Southern California. Oh, wonderful. And uh, I, got to, I got to read Seamus O'Neill for the first hour and a half. And uh, let me tell you, I've got a new career going. <laughs> I, I liked it. <laughs> Did you? I bet you liked it better than the Hollywood screenplay yeah. writing experiences that Gideon has that I have a feeling are also part of what you've drawn from your own life. I, m most, of the, most of it was rough. I had a very, very fine experience on Gunfight at the OK Corral. Uh, Hal Wallace uh, was a very wise man. He had people like Tennessee Williams writing for him. And uh, at one point in the, in the screenplay, he called the actors in and said, you leave Mr. Uris alone, he knows what he's doing. Mm. And uh, he, he didn't change a word in that screenplay, and, and it, I guess, came out pretty good. Oh, did it ever come out pretty good? <laughs> it's an understatement. Jill, your wife, wrote um, A Terrible Beauty which I absolutely loved. You two she, share... She, she, she took the pictures and I did the text. You did the text. But you, you two share a lot in common, don't you? Well, uh, we've uh, shared a bed in common for, for almost 20 years now, so uh, we're, uh, yes, uh, we, we have been an exceptionally uh, close couple, and uh, about 14, 15 years ago, or uh, 14 years into the marriage, pardon me, um, she didn't seem to be getting the fulfillment that she wanted as a, a photographer and um, suggested we try for a family. And I was uh, past 60 years old, and this isn't exactly what I had in mind, <laughs> but it, it was, it's been the most wonderful experience of my life. Having and had my first biological child at 41, Leon, did you really? I understand. Uh, Jill, yeah. <laughs> That's great, well, Jill isn't was, it? Uh, yeah, Jill, uh, yeah, and, and the, the whole uh, program today where the father is, is uh, made to feel uh, uh, not to totally useless during the birth process. I, I actually moved into the hospital. Great. And uh, took a had the, we shared a room together. And and the uh, Aspen Hospital is very wonderful that way. And uh, you can go into the nursery and take your baby anytime you want. And, and see what uh, you would have missed had you not done it. And Leon, I feel like I've, in a way, <laughs> although you are such a giving man, I've loved talking with you. I miss the fact that I haven't had a chance to actually be with you. If you ever come to Boston, would you please come and see us? I would so enjoy that. Yeah, you got me. Thank you, Leon. Mitla Pass is a wonderful, wonderful work, once again, by Leon Uris. God bless you, sir. You take care of yourself. Thank you. All Evan. right, Leon.